I feel like blessings keep falling on my... Oh, what is up, everybody? Mr. Purtis here. Welcome to unit number three, part three, 600 to 1450 on the Byzantine Empire. So far in this unit, we talked about the Islamic caliphates. We talked about the spread of Islam. We talked about China and the spread of Chinese culture. Um, here's what we're looking at today. We're looking at the Byzantine Empire, which we talked about a little bit in the last time period about the Roman Empire falling and it getting before it fell it's split in the half between the west and the east and this is the byzantine empire um, it changes a lot but really at the time of the islamic caliphate this is what we are looking at this is the islamic caliphate um, under the umayyads so we're kind of flashing back just a little bit you will notice and one of the themes here is there the byzantine empire and the islamic caliphate are always they border each other so you can imagine there's going to be a lot of conflict as the islamic caliphate is trying to spread the byzantine empire is going to be forced to um, put up defensive systems in place in order to stop them. But before we get into that, just a couple of things that you probably learned last year, just politically in terms of this Byzantine Empire, there is an emperor. He does have absolute power. And when I say absolute, I want you to think of completely. Like when someone says like, absolutely, I'm totally, I'm totally down with that. Um, we're thinking absolute power as in terms of total or complete power. When I say this, and when we talk about this as we go forward, we're talking about a complete power in terms of church and state. So both um, running the government structure, but also in charge of the religious day-to-day uh, -day activities. They're going to be in charge of both. Um, also, this is a theme. If you're not getting this, please wake up. But we're talking about a strong bureaucracy. You have to have a strong bureaucracy. It's so important. Um, so we have specific jobs. We have specific rankings. Um, and it's, it's a tough way to get into it. There's You have to be trained to do this. Uh, similar to today in the United States, if you want to be, for example, a teacher, um, you need to pass, you need to have a college degree. You need to pass tests. Um, there's certain things that you need to do in order to get into that profession. And the Byzantine Empire is a similar thing. You can't just kind of walk off the street and just become a member of the bureaucracy. There's a training program in place, and what really that does is it leads to confidence from its citizens that um, they are actually going to be um, well-educated people who can successfully carry out the laws of the government. And the other political thing that we're going to see is they're going to codify Greco-Roman laws. And by codify, what we're talking about is they're going to put these Greco-Roman laws, they're going to use them from the Roman Empire, and they're going to put them into a law code. Um, generally, it's referred to as Justinian's Code, which is going to happen in the mid-500s. And that's going to be used through most of the Byzantine Empire's history until they fall in 1453. So a couple things there. Um, in order to increase their legitimacy, and if you this term legitimacy is we kind of keep repeating this word over and over and over again. Legitimacy refers to um, something being real or someone agreeing with something. Um, for example, um, I am the teacher in AP World at West Hampton Beach. You believe that I'm the legitimate teacher. Whether or not you like me is a whole other story, but I'm a legitimate teacher. If some random person who teaches science walked in to class tomorrow and said, I am the legitimate teacher, you're not going to buy into it. They haven't convinced you that they are legitimate. So in this case, we need people to buy into this government system and to be convinced that this government system is one that they should support. Um, and through this, Justinian and people after him are going to increase this legitimacy through a couple ways. One, they are going to build the Hagia Sophia, um, which essentially means wisdom. Uh, this is a huge uh, religious building. There's a couple things I want you, I want to point out here. And if you notice, what do you, I'm not even going to tell you, but look what you see on the side here. Look at these. What are they from? Islam. Um, Justinian is not Islamic. They're not Muslim. The Byzantine Empire is not Muslim. But it, this should give you a little hint that over time the Byzantine Empire is going to fall to Muslims. and They're going to take this uh, church and they're going to make it into a mosque due to the minarets on the side. Also, we're going to build defensive walls to protect ourselves from invaders. That leads to confidence in the government. And also, we have a good road system. Um, similar to Rome, we're going to improve on the road system in the Byzantine Empire to improve trade, to allow for the transportation of goods and people and merchants, uh, which is good because it brings money into the empire. The capital city is Constantinople. Constantinople is located right up here. It is now called Istanbul. It really is an area that connects the east, and this is the east, to the west, which is over here. So um, in a lot of ways, the Constantinople is one of the main centers of trade, similar to Chang'an over here in China, Baghdad, which is located right up here. This is going to be another one of our key trade centers. And unlike a lot of these other places like China, for example, um, 
we're going to see even more, much more even than China, a much more cosmopolitan city, a lot of diversity, more so than China, more so than even Baghdad, where most of the people carrying out merchant activity in Constantinople are foreign merchants. They're merchants from other places. So they're not even from the Byzantine Empire. So we have a lot of people coming into this area, um, a lot of diversity, a lot of different ideas. And one positive thing that the Byzantine Empire gets their hands on is they're actually, I mentioned this in the China video, but the Byzantine Empire gets their hands on silkworms. Silkworms were smuggled out by members of the Byzantine Empire um, who bribed Chinese officials to smuggle out silkworms in a hollowed out cane, um, like a cane that you would walk with. So they smuggle out these silkworms. And once you have access to these silkworms, you can start having those silkworms reproduce and they also produce silk. So if you know the technique of how to make silk and you have silkworms, you can do this, which is going to allow the Byzantine Empire to start taking over this monopoly that the Chinese had had on silk for so long, which is going to bring them wealth. As with all things, when we talk about trade, there are some bad things about trade. And one thing we see in this time is we see a, the spread of the bubonic plague. In Global One or AP9, you talked about the bubonic plague in 1347, which is mainly Western Europe. But the bubonic plague is going to be throughout this time period. It's constantly bombarding people. And the Byzantine Empire gets hit in Constantinople very badly because of all these people coming in. Essentially, every generation is going to get hit with the bubonic plague in Constantinople for 200 straight years. It's bad. So we're going to see a huge population decrease. And this is really called Justinian's plague um, as a result of when it starts because of this increase in trade. Also, they're in constant conflict with the caliphates. And it's easy to get to Constantinople because of these trade routes. So that's the other issue. Um, we're going to see religiously, they are going to begin to separate and become a little different than the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church's center is in Rome. It's headed by the Pope. It's going on in this time period um, because of the split in Rome and the fact that Western Europe fell. The Eastern European Church um, in the Byzantine Empire is going to develop differently. And they're slowly going to kind of separate from each other. And I mean, language is going to be different. Uh, what they do in, in religious services are going to be different. Who's in charge is going to be different. Uh, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, they have people called patriarchs who are in charge of each specific region. So Greece has their own patriarch, the Greek Orthodox Church. Um, Byzantine has their own uh, patriarch who is their religious leader. And eventually we're going to see the Russian Orthodox Church. So it's a little less centralized. All right. This religion is a little more decentralized where each region has their own patriarch who gets to make decisions. The whole Eastern Orthodox versus Roman Catholicism comes to a head in the Great Schism of 1054, where the two sides split. There's a lot of disagreements over really small things, what language they should use in the mass. And the final real straw is when they make the bread for uh, the Eucharist, which and Eucharist is the um, what's just the the bread turns into Jesus. Uh, so you actually eat part of Jesus in Christian or Catholic ceremonies and what the bread should be made in, what the ingredients should be. And in Western Europe, they say there should not be any yeast in there, which means the bread doesn't rise. And in Eastern Europe or Eastern Orthodox, they say it should. And that little thing causes this huge split. And the Eastern Orthodox Church excommunicates or kicks the Roman Catholic Church members out. And the Roman Catholic Church members kick out the Eastern Orthodox members. And that's the official split. The schism means split. Um, we do see some missionary activity. The emperor in uh, 800 of the Byzantine Empire, so down here in Constantinople, he sends missionaries up to attempt to convert the people in this area right here who are called the Rus people, R-U-S, Rus. Rus means red because the people had red hair. They're going to be referred to as the Rus people. There are people up here in small trade areas. The trade was originally, these trade centers were originally set up by people over here. So these people set up trade centers. So there's small little trade centers with these Rus people. And eventually the Byzantine Empire decides they want to convert some of these people to their religion. So they send people up here to actually convert them. And it's successful. And the guy who is mainly in charge of this is a man over here. His name is Saint Cyril. He's going to come up here. He's going to translate the Bible into uh, the Slavic language, which is the kind of the, the umbrella language this is referred to as. And they are going to set up an alphabet for these people who are pretty much at this point um, I have two flies in here flying around me. That's great. Uh, two different languages that are going to be one. I'm sorry. The language is going to be called the Cyrillic alphabet. So it's set up by this guy named St. Cyril. So he creates this alphabet that is still in effect today. Um, and it's still the language in Russia today. Also, they set up a law code um, for these people. So this is going to be kind of the beginning of this is going to be the beginning of I have three flies in here now. This is great. Um, 
they're going to set up a law code. So this is going to be the beginning of the Russian civilization. This is kind of where we see it all start. Um, socially, uh, there one thing to point out that kind of gets mentioned on the AP exam sometimes are there are free peasants who actually revolt during this time. Kind of one funny or interesting story for those of you who watch soccer and know about hooligan soccer and like fighting each other, or if you're a football fan, like and I'm an Eagles fan, you don't come down to Philadelphia to an Eagles game wearing a Giants shirt because you're going to get a uh, beverage sport spilled on you or someone's going to get into a fight with you. And this is not new. In 1530 or 532, there was uh, what's called the Nika riots. There were chariot races going on in Constantinople. There was the blue team and the green team. And the blue and the green team, um, a fight breaks out between the blues and the greens. And a riot breaks out as a result of these fights. The riots get so bad that Justinian is on the docks waiting to leave, trying to leave Constantinople to get out. And he's waiting on the dock to get on his boat. And his wife, Theodora, come, Theodora comes up grabs him off the dock and is like, you are not leaving. You are staying behind here and you are, you are, you're coming back. So he comes back into where these riots are breaking out, week long riots, destroying the city, like total craziness. And he decides to trick the 20,000 rioters into going back into the center of the town square. He surrounds them and then he executes all 20,000 of them. So it's this huge revolt that happens. They put it down, kind of shows that uh, not everyone's happy with what's going on at the time, but all this just started over a sporting event and being angry about sports. Um, real quick in Western Europe, you learned a lot of this last year, so I just want to highlight it real quick just to remind you, there's feudalism going on in Western Europe. It is decentralized, meaning that the power is in the hands of many people. There is a king, but he doesn't have all the power. Good to know. Um, and this is our, we have the nobles, we have the knights, we have the peasants, and we'll talk more about this in class, but a lot of people usually remember this from last year, so I don't want to harp on it too much. Also, the Crusades is going on at this time in 1094. The Roman Catholic uh, Pope sends, is asked by the Byzantine Empire to help them reclaim the Holy Land down here. So he sends crusaders. Uh, Crus means uh, cross in Latin, and they had crosses painted on their shield. So he sends crusaders down here to help reclaim this land. What is important about this and why you should even remember this in any way, shape, or form? And this is the one thing about the Crusades. These isolated, dark, aged, somewhat backwards people living on their manners. These knights are gonna travel all the way to here. Now remember, the, they've been in these dark ages. They don't know, they're not aware of what's going on in the world. They don't know about the caliphates in China and Silk and the Byzantine Empire. So they end up going down here into this region right here, which is the center of trade. So you have all these crusaders or knights coming down into this region and they see all of these products. They see silk, they see cotton, they see sugar. Um, they see all these spices. They see different groups of people from different nationalities coming into this area. And they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. This is amazing. I can make some money off this. So they bring, they buy stuff. And then after the crusades is over, they bring it back into their regions, their city states here in Europe. And they're like, so they start selling stuff and they make money. And once they make money, other people are like, oh my God, I can make money too. So I'm going to do the same thing. So we see merchant activity increase. A lot of ideas that were in the Muslim empire, the Greco-Roman ideas come back to Europe and people are like, wow, this is amazing. Maybe I'll start painting like they did during Greece and Rome, AKA the Renaissance. Um, last thing that you did not learn about last year, I'm assuming is called the Hanseatic League. This is a trade alliance between Northern European city-states. They basically come together and they say, hey, city-state over here, you make horseshoes. We make horseshoes here and here and here and here. Let's connect our horseshoe qualities together and let's say, We'll make sure no one else makes horseshoes unless you are in this Hanseatic League. So we can control trade up here. We'll trade with each other. We'll make sure we set prices and that we're making enough money um, and we are in good shape. And the league itself is called the Hansa. Um, if you know anything about Germany, if you ever travel to Germany, their main airline is called Lufthansa, which is kind of named after this. Um, but in this way, we have just have a trade alliance between these Northern European cities um, and the 1100s and 1200s. So they're not totally isolated after the Crusades. This is going to help out. Um, that is my story for today. If you have any questions, as always, take some notes, ask me, uh, and we'll go forward from there. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a good day.